Good morning, class. Good morning, Mr. Barnes. Today we're going to discuss some of the North American explorers of the 16th century. The explorers that we'll be, we'll be focusing on today are Alvar Nunez Cabeza de Vaca, Hernando de Soto, and Francisco Vasquez de Coronado, all from Spain. You should have read a bit about them, these men in your text last night. Let's see how much you learned while reading. Following the oversimplified model of exploration, Sunil, what was Cabeza de Vaca's motivation to explore? Well, um, uh, yeah, I'm just saying, well, we fail. <laughs> Cabeza de Vaca left in. Cabeza de Vaca left in 1527 and landed on the island of Santo Domingo, where he and his crew resided for 45 days. He traveled on to Santiago on the island of Cuba to transport some goods. The situation in Santiago was noted to be very remarkable, and he said that those kind of happenings are what he wants in his narrative. The next day sported bad weather, so Cabeza de Vaca and his crew spent their time in Cuba. When he and the crew left, they did not spot land until 1528. They landed in a bay in which they could see villages of Indians. The Indians approached them, but because Cabeza de Vaca did not have an interpreter, they could not understand them. They thought the Indians were exchanging threats. Some of the Indians took the Europeans aside and guided them to where they needed to go. The guides left after a while, and a dispute arose in which Cabeza de Vaca and his crew were cornered. They traveled many leagues and suffered from hunger. In June, they came inside of Appalachian, an Indian inhabited town. Cabeza de Vaca and crew ate the crops the natives were growing because they were starving. The Indians found out and attacked them the next day. The group stayed there for days. After the stay, they marched down to Ayub, which took eight days. The Europeans soon angered the Indians. Cabeza de Vaca and his crew decided to depart from the bay. The Indians ambushed their camp and fled to the sea. The group sailed to Pensacola and followed the coast until they reached the mouth of the Mississippi River. At the arrival of the river, Indians ambushed them. One of Cabeza de Vaca's two barges sank, leaving one to freely float and land ashore in the New World. So that's how it went, Mr. Barnes. Very good, Sunil. That was, that was a very in-depth explanation. Hmm. Cassie, can you explain the journey of Cabeza de Vaca? Well, it kind of went like this. And moved on. Using his keen exploration skills, he led his crew through the Texas terrain. The Indians kept them prisoners, but they achieved to escape the Indian campgrounds. Then the Indians fell into ailment, and they needed someone to cure them. The crew helped by offering a medicine man in order to help with the tensions of the Indians. The Europeans made their way to the Trinity River, where they ended up, where they set up a trading post. Cabeza de Vaca stayed in that region for six years, wandering to the different villages to make money. After those years, Cabeza de Vaca set off for the Mata Gorda Bay. The bay was across four separate streams in which they had to cross. They had enough supplies from their trading post to be able to traverse the terrain. Soon to follow were the deaths of some of the crew, and the others tried to explain what had happened. One side of the story said they had drowned at sea, whereas some others said the Indians slaughtered them. This raised tensions between them and the Indians, so they had to flee. The mission that Cabeza de Vaca was leading still went strong until the Indians grew aggressive. The Indian tribes near the Europeans split into different factions. This scared Cabeza de Vaca and crew, so they had to make an escape. Their narrow escape caused many people of the group to grow sick and they needed more cures. As they lived peacefully in another community, they started to live among the natives. The Avavares and the Arbadeos took them in as friends. Cabeza de Vaca learned a lot about the Indians when he lived among them. He did not quite understand their customs as to how they married or how they lived their lives. They would seem at war with each other more than anything. Regardless, Cabeza de Vaca and his crew traded with the Indians for necessities and moved on from village to village. They were making their way westward slowly. Their current location was at the fork of the Rio Grande and the Pecos Rivers. They continued to move westward, following the Rio Grande. The month's march across the desert was harsh. Their supplies ran out fast, and much of the crew was exhausted. They ran into what they called cow people. These people traded, even though the Europeans were scared of them, because they went on massive cattle-killing sprees. They continued to trek westward until they reached a place they called the Town of Hearts. They stayed there for three days. Cabeza de Vaca and his men crossed the Rocky Mountains, and made their way to the Gulf of California in January of 1536. 
When they reached the coast, their sole purpose became their transformation of the Native Americans. They set up numerous amounts of missions and even convinced the Indians to build crosses. In July, Cabeza de Vaca and his men entered Mexico City, their final destination. The Viceroy greeted them upon their arrival. Cabeza de Vaca decided to take some rest. He remained in Mexico City for two months. After the hiatus, he ordered to be taken back to his residence in Europe. The ship was to take him back capsized, and he remained in the New World for winter. He traveled back to Havana, and then departed from Spain. His ships tangled with European fire, and he ended up landing in Portugal in 1537. He published his journal. Future explorers such as Coronado de Soto found the stories of the New World intriguing, which evidently sent them on their explorations. Very good, very good class. Uh, let's move on to the next explorer, which happens to be Hernando de Soto. Now, who knows what Hernando de Soto's motivation was? Anyone? No. We don't know. No idea. I'll explain it, I guess. It was a little uh, shaky in the book. His motivation. When, ever since he was a little kid, he had always been in love with adventure and excitement. And when he grew up, he knew that he was going to be an explorer. Does that clear things up for you, class? Yeah, I guess so. Kind of, yeah. Let's move on to his journey. Do, do any of you know where he came from? Was it Spain? Yeah, he came from Spain. And his journey went a little like this. year of 1539, Fernando de Soto sailed from Havana, Cuba, where he was previously living, and route to Florida with a formidable army of about 600 men. They landed near Tampa Bay and continued north along the coast of the Gulf of Mexico on foot or horseback. For about four years, Fernando de Soto and his soldiers explored about 350,000 square miles in the territory that was then known as Florida. They explored through present-day Georgia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Tennessee, Alabama, Mississippi, Arkansas, Louisiana, and of course, through Florida, where they had landed. In May of 1541, Hernando de Soto and his soldiers became the first Europeans to see the famous Mississippi River. Hernando de Soto became enemies with the native peoples because he seized their valuables. He stole their food. He thoughtlessly burned their villages. He enslaved them, and he mercilessly killed many who openly opposed him. This cruelty on Hernando de Soto's part did not come cheap as he lost many of his men due to the number of battles with the indigenous people of Florida. Fernando de Soto's army spent the winter from 1541 to 1542 near the junction of the Canadian Arkansas rivers in Oklahoma. The situation was looking grim for all in Hernando de Soto's expedition, for sickness and hunger had struck his troops. In spring of 1542, they returned to the Mississippi River, where de Soto died of a fever on May 21st. His right-hand man, Louis de Moscoso, sank his captain, de Soto's body in the river in order to keep his death a secret. Moscoso and Fernando de Soto's remaining troops did not want the local people to find out that de Soto was not immortal, and he had claimed to be. He feared of many of the native peoples for what had been done to them by Hernando de Soto and his men. Moscoso may have been especially afraid of retaliation by the townspeople of nearby Anilco, where de Soto had ordered the native people to be massacred, even when ill on his deathbed. Moscoso and his soldiers built barges and sailed down the Mississippi River to the Gulf of Mexico to escape from the natives before the truth about Hernando de Soto's death got out to them. They then sailed southwest along the coast of the Gulf until they reached Panuco, Mexico in September of 1543. Just a little over half of de Soto's original count of 600 men survived the entire journey and ended up, and ended up in Panuco, which can be found toward the northeastern corner of present-day Mexico. Over the course of the exploration, they had found no gold or treasure like they had expected to, other than a chest of poor quality pearls, which they had lost in a battle anyway. In despair, they left behind them many dead, dead soldiers, disease, and the memory of their former captain, Hernando de Soto. to see the Mississippi River, but he also died. So, I would 
I say no. Let's move on to Coronado. Cassie, what was Coronado's motivation to explore? Well, after commencing a Baca's exploration of the New World, this, um, he brought back exaggerated reports of the Seven Cities of Gold. Well, this got the attention of the Viceroy of New Spain, and he decided to send out exploration to see if these, this story of the Seven Cities of Gold was really true. Mm -hmm. So he sent out another, another expedition, this time with Fray Marcos de Niza. Well, Fray Marcos de Niza came back with exaggerating stories also, and so he sent another expedition with Coronado, and this is why Coronado explored. That's very good, very in-depth. Erica, would you care to uh, explain about Coronado's journey? Well... Pues. <laughs> Coronado explored so much of the southwestern United States, one of the reasons he is so honorably looked upon. After first collecting in Compostela, Coronado began his expedition. Coronado led his expedition from Nueva Galicia to Zuni, New Mexico, a Pueblo Indian village on the Zuni River on the western border of New Mexico. Fray Marcos de Niza, who went to explore the territory before Coronado, did not even make it as far as Zuni. After the six months of traveling, his men were tired and worn from the hardships and grind of the long, rough trail. Coronado sent Cardenas one, one day ahead with a group of about 15. Cardenas reached the Brio Fermejo, where he was greeted by four natives of Cibola. There you go. They said that they came in peace, and that the natives of Cibola were awaiting the arrival of the Spaniards to supply them with food. Cardenas sent Alvarado, one of the men among him, back to relay the good news to Coronado. But first, two of the natives were held hostage in the chance that the natives were lying. Alvarado led Coronado, after relaying this news, to where Cardenas was camped. Coronado dealt greatly with the two hostages from Cibola, giving them paternosters and some little cloaks. He then sent Cardenas ahead one more day to make sure that there were no troubling await Coronado, as had been expected. Near a lake, Coronado saw some native Cibolans and had some of his men bring them before him. Coronado explained to his guests that he had come in the name of the great emperor across the water to place them under his domination and afford them a knowledge of God. He told the natives that they ought to be Christians in order to remain unharmed. Marching on, Coronado heard that at Hawiku, the water, water, westernmost Zuni Pueblo, he should expect an unfriendly greeting. Once again, Cardenas was sent a day ahead with the orders to clear it out, speaking of the Pueblo village. Once near the Bad Pass, Cardenas encountered more native Cibolans, which he gave crosses and told them to send word back to the others that the Spaniards had come in peace. Cardenas set up camp, feeling good. That night, that same night, the Spaniards with Cardenas were attacked, frightening away the horses. However, because of the aid of the two sentinels, the men were spared, but left on foot. Someone was sent to tell Coronado of the happenings. Coronado caught up with Cardenas at the Bad Pass where he learned more in detail what exactly that had ex happened concerning the attack. Moving along, Cardenas and his troops again started ahead of Coronado up the Zuni River. More cautiously, however. Hunger now outweighed any fears they might have entertained. Not long after, someone saw sight of Hawiku. This is what the Spaniards had been waiting for. They had arrived at the first of the seven cities. The, the supposed first of seven cities filled with gold. At this point, Sore muscles limbered up and bruises were momentarily forgotten. However, once they moved in, they found the city to be nothing more than a Pueblo village, not the wonderfully sparkling city filled with gold and jewels. Later, Coronado moved his army to the Rio Grande, which is located in the southwestern Colorado. During the winter, they camped at the Tiwa Pueblos near modern-day Bernalillo. Coronado led his army as far east as present-day Kansas. His returning trip was long and Coronado faced many problems along the way. He met an Indian, which he called the Turk, who told him about Quivira, a rich country in the northwest. He decided to look for Quivira, taking the Turk as his guide. He traversed the Texan panhandle and marched on further north. He had led Coronado and his troops astray through Quivira and later executed for it. During what stretch of their return, Coronado broke away from the old trail at the place where the Turk had led them away from the correct route at Tequex. Finally, we arrived at and recognized the place where as I said at the beginning, we found the rancheria where the Turk led us away from the route we ought to have followed. These, the words of Jaramillo, explain exactly what was wrong with Coronado's return home across the Arkansas River. Along the way home, Coronado's marching through the cities is partly where his, his fame comes from. 
He went through many cities in Kansas, the Oklahoma Panhandle, the Texas Panhandle, and in New Mexico, he discovered Naravisa, Obar, and Logan. You were so running around. Good job, Erica. So, Cassie, what was Coronado's publication, and what outcome did it have? Coronado's account of his explorations were published after his death in 1554. He really bring no gold or wealth to the north. His reports were valued for their detailed descriptions of the southwestern United States. The outcome of his exploration was, well, after he explored, he, this, like, there was many tales that were passed around, and that spurred more explore, exploration and more colonization. And also, he became famous because of his exploration of the southwestern United States, and he added, like, he added many cities to the maps of the interior of North, of North America. Very good, class. Uh, I think this concludes our lesson for today. I'll see you tomorrow. Bye. Hell yeah! <laughs> Class, this you should have said tomorrow our lesson is real fully teaching. Yeah, no, I'll